like a big parade. This happened also in Mexico. As in this case, they fly together again above the skies of Cuernavaca. As you see, all of them keep their place in the formation. Sometimes they move very fast, like in this video. When we see them closely, we can clearly see that they are spheres moving at a very fast speed. Sometimes they, very lately, Tasco Morelos, close to Cuernavaca, we can see how these objects move. Close to the mountain. These videos are in different days, and there are many others, but I couldn't show you all of them, but you can see how these spheres go inside the woods. They come out, they go close to the houses. It is clear that these movements are intelligent. This video is from the Air Force in Mexico, probably you have seen it. This was given to me by the Secretary of Defense in March 2004, where we can see clearly a formation of UFOs being recorded by a FLIR camera. This video has become very famous, recorded by Pedro Hernandez, one of my collaborators. You can see the object very close to an airplane. And then you can see how it releases hundreds, probably thousands of little spheres. Now we can see that it's moving very fast. And the little spheres come back to the mothership and go around. And then the spheres make a fleet in the sky. Formations, signs, messages. This video was so important that fortunately we had a second witness. Here we have the so-called fleet, as in the other cases moving information. Here we have the second video of the same object releasing all the spheres. 
and you can see how they move information too in a big line. Also in the space, we have seen many UFOs. For example, this one that was not presented by the American television on September 19, 2006. This object didn't allow the Atlantis to come back to Earth until 24 hours later. Seems little, but was 20 kilometers away. Something that, you know. She's Marianne Stephanie Chin Piper. Please listen to her. Something that you've never seen before. And when I finally got to go out the door, that was something different too. And I figured that would never happen without the uh, preparation we had draining the team. And so I'd like. <coughs> Wait, it happened twice to this astro uh, to this uh, astronaut. What did she see? She saw things like this: these big UFOs hovering very near the International Space Station. They come, present themselves, and then they just leave. We have one object moving behind the solar panels. You can see the solar panels and you can see this object moving behind them. In so many of the missions, your house have seen there, has been recorded there. We have the biggest collection in the world because we record the whole ex missions. We saw a UFO coming very close to the shore when it was landing. Here you have this object making incredible movements in the sky, in the space. You've never seen this because it has never been presented to the American public. This is the last mission before the one that we have now and observe now a fleet in the sky. Okay, uh, I'm going to let all my colleagues here to speak to you because all of them have very good evidence. I will come back at the end of this presentation to finish with what I brought to you. Thank you very much. You. Donald Schmidt is uh, the best investigator of the Roswell case. This man, this man put Roswell in the map. If you have heard about Roswell, it's because of him. He's the man who 
took this case when it was long forgotten back in 1989, and he made it what we now know as the most important case in the UFO history in the United States. Please, my friend Donald Schmidt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk about another type of evidence, physical evidence, evidence that would convict a criminal as far as in any court of law, eyewitness testimony. Because we start with precisely that. I've now, my partners and I, we've talked to over 600 witnesses concerning one single event. Now granted, it happened years before I was born. And for all of my colleagues who told me, well, there's no way you can investigate something that happened 50 years ago. But nonetheless, the, the moment that we determined that this case was important enough, that if true, was the biggest story of the millennium, it was worth making the effort. And that was in 1989 we started. I was a skeptic. I thought we would make one single trip down to New Mexico and wrap this up in a single weekend. And then we started to actually talk to eyewitnesses who handled unusual material, material that defied conventional explanation beyond anything we even have by today's standards. Now when I do say the word Roswell, how many, I mean, have even heard of that name and I think most of you, obviously, it becomes synonymous with not only the term UFO crash, but also government cover-up. Because we all should be aware of the fact there are now up to four official explanations for the same event. As a husband, any of us should try that with our wives some night coming home late, you know, on some occasion. Well, if you don't like this one, honey, try this one. <laughs> and that's what the government continues to ask us to do because what they are simply doing is running out the clock, waiting until the final witness has passed away. It's now going to be 64 years. And we still have witnesses. We are still finding some of the, the lower enlisted men at that time the grunt men who were sent out to actually get down on their hands and knees and pick up you know, every shred of evidence that they could find out in that high desert of New Mexico. But we're running a race with the undertaker, as we often put it. And they're just waiting in Washington, just thinking just a few more years and it's cover up complete. Well, that's where we come in. Because we're making sure that we're giving every individual one final opportunity to tell the truth of what actually happened back in that high desert of New Mexico in 1947. Now, most of you who know your history, and I assume you all do, New Mexico was the hotbed of all military activity at that time. Through the final years of World War II and thereafter, I find it rather amusing that especially on college campuses, how often I ask, where was the first atomic bomb detonated? And how many college professors, well, Japan, Japan. And I say, no, in the United States. In fact, in New Mexico. It happened in June of 1945, about two hours just west of Roswell. And in 1945, the very squadron, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group, was headquartered at Roswell. Now any of you could go to your local public libraries and pull out all the microfilm, the microfiche of all the newspapers from that late week of June through first week of July of 1947. And you would see banner headline after headline about the arrival of the flying disks. And then the very term flying saucer was even coined at that time. Not because of the way they were shaped, but rather by the way they maneuvered through the air as one search and rescue pilot described them. So the contemporary age of UFOs would start in the summer of 1947. 
My former scientific director, and many of you being from the Chicago area, you might even remember the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek, Northwestern University. I was one of his special investigators for six years. I was his director of special investigations. I was on his board of directors for 10 years. And he started out as a complete skeptic, as a consultant to the official Project Blue Book, the Air Force's longest official investigation of UFOs. So I feel I had the best possible teacher in setting up the parameters of what I require as being legitimate, hardcore evidence. And that evidence, once again, being eyewitness testimony, circumstantial. Because even any good lawyer, any good judge would tell you, footprints in the snow don't necessarily prove the individual who made those tracks. But the eyewitnesses who saw the person do it do. And that's precisely what we have at Roswell. We have not only the people who were out in the field, civilians who first saw and handled the debris, debris that, as witnesses described, silken strands of material, that you could hold a light up to one end and the light would emit out the opposing end. Well, in 1947, they're describing fiber optics, which wouldn't come into vogue until around 1970. Thin, paper-thin sheets of material, about four foot in diameter, practically weightless in your hands, and yet descriptions of how they would take a 16-pound sledgehammer and pound on the material, and the hammer would just bounce right off without making a scratch or the slightest mar on the material. And then what we call our holy grail, the material that dozens of witnesses have described to us both civilian and military. The reason we have already conducted three archeological digs at the crash site, because we're looking for that needle in a haystack. Material that, again, paper thin, you couldn't cut, you couldn't burn, you couldn't drill through it, and yet you could crumble it up in your hand, you could crunch it, you could crease it, and then you would open your hand or you would lay it down and it would flow like water. It would just smooth right out. One of the witnesses, very curiously, from her own vantage point, when she was shown a piece by one of the local ranchers, as he was clutching it and opening his hand back and forth, and it kept unraveling and smoothing out, she thought, wouldn't it be great if clothes would be made of such material, and I would never have to iron again? So again, it demonstrates, again, a visual impact She's seeing it for what she saw, that it unfolds and it smooths right out. We don't have such material even today. You have to heat such material and then cool it before it will assume its original shape and size. It's called memory material. Again, we call it our holy grail because that's what will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that we are not alone, that there is a technology beyond the planet that has been visiting Earth and actually crashed back in 1947. Now, many of you are aware of the fact that on July 8th of 1947, the United States Army actually announced to the world they had captured a legitimate flying saucer. Banner headlines throughout the country. Unfortunately, Within five hours, that explanation was retracted. It became a very common weather balloon with a radar reflector kite. Now, if you were to ask me what was that balloon, that weather balloon constructed of, if there are any children here, I'd like to ask any one of you if you wouldn't have a problem identifying rubber, reflective foil, wooden sticks, masking tape, and string. So the very thought that the most elite unit within the military, in charge of the atomic bomb, no less, would have had a problem identifying something a five-year-old child would have recognized. And yet, after Roswell was explained away, you still have 50 to 60 troops who are gathering up every last piece of the physical evidence they are going from ranch to ranch out in that high desert country of New Mexico. 
They are going through ranch houses. They are pulling up floorboards. They are pulling out drawers of dressers, opening up closets. They're going down into storm shelters. They're looking everywhere and anywhere, retrieving every piece of physical evidence of a weather balloon. Because it wasn't a weather balloon. It wasn't a rocket. It wasn't a plane. It wasn't anything we had ever seen before. And the most important element in all of this, the very rancher who first discovers the debris field and reports it days after the find, I've had even colleagues suggest that maybe it was something top secret, maybe it was one of ours. You've seen some of the footage actually showing the site, which is high desert, it's wide open territory. It's open grazing land. As often as I've been in a small plane or a helicopter, once airborne, you can see for 100 miles. The point is, we weren't missing anything. Nobody was looking for anything. And that's why when the rancher reported it, they behaved the manner by which they did. They had no idea what they were examining. As the former base commander at Roswell said, at first we thought it had to be Russian because nobody could re recognize it. But then after it was tested, we realized, God help us if it isn't ours because, again, they couldn't even put a scratch on the material. And the one thing that, again, sent, sent shivers down their backs as one of the officers described that when they came back to the barracks at the base at Roswell, the first night of the recovery, they walked past the barracks and you could hear men either crying or praying. Now these are the men that had stormed the beaches in Normandy. These are the men that had bombed Berlin and Tokyo. These are the men who had just gone through the worst horrors of war. And yet, as one of the witnesses has been unable to sleep in the same room as his wife for over 40 years because of the flashbacks, the memories of not the material, but the fact that when they were ordered to move a number of gurneys from building 84, it was called P3, it was a B-29 hangar at the base at that time. And one of the sheets pulled free. And whatever was underneath it moved. And he looked down and it looked up and its eyes opened. That's the image he, to this day, and he will cry, the tears...